taking questions on IRC in the Air Mozilla channel, as usual. Uh, today, for the first time, we're broadcasting live from Portland, Oregon, which is also the <laughs> also the home of our speaker, uh, Dr. Genevieve Bell. Dr. Bell is a senior fellow and vice president at Intel, where she leads the Corporate Sensing and Insights group there. Uh, her education and training as an anthropologist makes her insights especially relevant to us at Mozilla, where our organization, our mission, give us a uh, ability to put the needs of people before anything else. Um, as we enter a phase of technology where we have billions of machines talking to billions of other machines, they're all doing this still in the service of people for now. Uh, while we're still in charge, let's learn more about us. Please welcome Dr. Genevieve Bell. Oh, well, how exciting is that to be broadcasting live from Portland, Oregon? Go us. Yay! And I like that I am imagined to be from here. It's literally the first two days I've been here continuously in two months. So <laughs> go me. And when I look at all the places you are broadcasting to, can I just say hello, London? Because I'd love to be there too. Anyway, all right. So I promised that what I wanted to do here when I was asked to come was talk a little bit about what it means to be human in a world with an increasing proliferation of new and different forms of technology. I've been lucky enough to be in and around Silicon Valley for well, nearly half my life at this point, and I've witnessed a number of changes in what that technological infrastructure looks like. When I first moved to the Valley was, you know, I found my first email address the other day. It was a very strange experience indeed. And I remember, you know, as I'm sure many of us do, kind of early iterations of the internet and the web and the first kind of round of every new device that came along and every language we wrapped around it, that it was the next killer device and this was going to be the thing that changed everything. And many of those changes happened, many didn't. And I realize that we're now kind of standing in this next moment that for me seems to be critical of moving from a world where computation is about devices to a world where computation is about devices and data. And I'm really interested in thinking through that transition and what it might mean. I also realize that as someone who's been at Intel for nearly 18 years and who spent most of my career there in people's homes around the world, I'm in a kind of interesting position to reflect back on what that has told me about the things people care about. Because I think one of the other sort of discourses we wrap around technology is that it changes everything. And the reality is things don't change as quickly as we think. And there are some things that human beings have cared about and conversely worried about that are remarkably stable over time. And I want to kind of reflect on some of those and think about how they ought to shape the way we develop technology. So there's lots of ways to describe myself. That was a gracious introduction in many regards. I think the things that are important about me are embedded in that. One is that I am indeed an anthropologist. My training is in cultural anthropology. I have a background in Native American studies, feminist theory, and queer theory. You can imagine why Intel hired me. Um, an obvious choice in that regard. Hashtag not. Um, but, you know, I came to my kind of my anthropological training in a complicated set of ways. I'm also the daughter of an anthropologist, and I grew up on my mother's field sites in central and northern Australia in the 1970s and 1980s. So I spent my childhood living with indigenous people in a time when they could still remember their country before white fellas and fences and cattle, and who, for the bulk of my childhood, were more than willing to take my brother and I bush. So I spent most of my childhood running around without shoes, not speaking English. I spoke the local languages in this community and getting to kill pretty much anything that moved and eat it. I hasten to add, before I sound like a psychopath in training, it was all in the spirit of hunting and gathering. Uh, that's me in that picture there. Uh, I'm the one in the middle holding the smallest of the lizards. My brother turned out to be a very good hunter. I was less adequate, but I could still eat pretty well. So, frankly, it was a remarkably feral childhood. I mean, in some ways, that's a label that I've kind of kept ever since. It was also, in some ways, the best possible childhood you could imagine. Not only did it have this kind of capacity to be a little bit wilder than I think my peers were, it also gave me an opportunity to live in a very different place where I was always both other and in the world. And there was something about that capacity to get to spend time in other people's places and hear the stories that gave meaning to those places and to be included in it and also get to go back to where I was also from that was a really interesting kind of moment of being an insider and an outsider and I think it's kind of shaped my life ever after and it's a very long way from Ali Karung in Central Australia to Silicon Valley 
and a longer way still from Stanford to Intel, although that is a well-beaten path if you're an engineer or a mathematician or a physicist or a computer scientist. It's a very strange path if you're an anthropologist. Um, and truthfully, I had finished my PhD and I was teaching at Stanford when in the spring of 1998, in true Australian fashion, I met a man in a bar in Palo Alto. <laughs> And he changed my life. I'm a terrible person to get career advice from. Apparently, my career advice involves stand around in bars and say yes to men with interesting offers. <laughs> you all may well laugh, and yet, as a career coach, that was not bad advice in 1998 when Silicon Valley was full of interesting offers. I'm not quite sure what it would look like today. But at the time, it was an offer that led me to working at Intel and starting up our first building out, in fact, our first UX practices, hiring our first UX researchers, really thinking about what it would mean to have a UX roadmap, a UX orientation, what it meant to think even beyond user experience in that sense, to thinking about what it meant to put humans in the middle of our design process and our thinking. And my job at Intel really has been to think about what is it that people care about? What are they passionate about? What are their pain points, their frustrations, and their aspirations? And how might we use all of that to think about next generation technology development? So how do we use those insights about human beings to complement the technology we're already developing? Sometimes to be a check on it, and sometimes to say, hey, that's the wrong problem to solve. I know it's a really interesting technical problem, but the thing you should be thinking about is over here. And so it's always been this sort of interesting dialogue. In the last couple of years, I've moved from doing a rigid focus on UX into thinking a little bit more about strategy. About two years ago, I moved out of the UX labs and into helping build Intel's first corporate strategy office, basically. And as part of that, took on a brief where I find myself as being um, full-time anthropologist and now part-time futurist. So part of my job has expanded not just to think about what do people want today, but what will the world look like 10, year, 10 15 years from now? How do we think about the kind of rapid intersections of human practice, government and regulation, public policy, but also technology affordances and technology development, and how might you sort of thread the needle with all of those things. And so there's this sort of weird, interesting space of getting to think both about the present and the future. But as an anthropologist, I can't help but approach the future the same way I've always approached the present, which is to ask the same questions of it. Like, okay, that's nice that we have a story about the future, but who's in it and what are they doing? And you know, how might we ask the right questions about it rather than going, oh, shiny, good build. We should say, hmm, shiny, why? And what are we missing? What's been erased? What's being celebrated? What's being brought into that future that we might want to ask some hard questions about? And frankly, when you start to take that point of view, it becomes very easy to sort of say, hmm, many stories we've told about the future, we've been telling for a really long time. Um, this piece of advertising collateral came out of a, a 1956 Time magazine. And it was a piece of an advertising inset from the California Electrical Association lobby. So effectively the lobby group and the lobbying arm of the power companies inside California. And they published this image, which ought to look awfully familiar to us because I'm fairly certain that's autonomous vehicles circa 1956. The way you know it's 1956, he's driving and wearing a tie. Um, <laughs> And it's still a nuclear straight family. I mean, a little bit of heteronormativity going on here. Um, they're also playing a board game, which I know have come back in the interim, but certainly didn't come back between 1956 and about 2014. So there's some other things going on here, right? But the collateral around it and the text that accompanies this image is definitely familiar. The reason for self-driving cars, according to the California Electrical Lobby in 1956, was about traffic jams and safety. That should sound familiar. Those are the same narratives we wrap around self-driving cars now. The same advertising collateral carried this other sort of inset here about what the future of the home might feel like. Uh, again, remember 1956 here. So air conditioning and televisions are just the beginning of the electrical age. Yay. You could add IoT here and you'd sort of feel like you were reading the same text again. Your food will be cooked in seconds instead of hours, so anticipating the proliferation of microwave ovens. Electricity will close your windows at the first drop of rain. Okay, smart homes, hello. Lamps will cut off on, on and off automatically to fit the light, lighting needs of your house. Hello, Philips Hue light bulbs, you know, Alexa and a few other things. Television screens will hang on the walls. So flat panel, circa 1956, not a bad thought. An electrical pump will be outside to cool your house in summer and heat it in winter. 
hello dual heating systems, you know, we, we know what these look like, right? Now, of course, what's fascinating here is that the technology is understood to bring a certain set of expectations to the home and make the home more efficient. Were you to look at the stories we told about the first electrical homes back in the world's fairs in the 1930s and 1940s, you'd find all the same things. Kitchens will become electrified, homes will be smarter, more efficiency will be driven. What's fascinating here is that it's the same story. And if you think about some of the things we now talk about smart homes, this should sound a little bit familiar. The thing that is different is there's now an overlay of content and security would be the two things we've added, right? What is never present in any of these stories are a whole series of other things. Who lives in this house? What are their relationships to one another? What are the challenges inside that relationship? What are the anxieties? What are the pain points? What are the stories we never talk about? We spend a lot of time talking about smart homes. We don't spend a lot of time talking about what happens in homes. Homes are sites of remarkable violence against women and children. Homes are sites of a proliferation of accidents. Turns out about 30% of admissions to emergency rooms in the United States come from domestic accidents. Most of those involve ladders. If you were building a smart home, the single best function it could have would be to say, oi, you, get off the ladder. Or, oi, you, on the ladder, stop going up so high on the ladder. That little instruction that's printed on the ladder, if that were a verbal cue, we might actually see smart homes doing something constructive. But that's not the story we tell this is. So what's going on here, right? What is the fascination about how you talk about technology and about what isn't in this narrative? And for me, what isn't in this story is the important piece, right, which is all of us. So what does it mean to think about putting people into those stories and how might that function? Because it turns out, and I sort of foreshadowed this a little minute ago, what makes us human is remarkably stable over time. There are things that we care about as human beings, manifested differently in different cultures, that are remarkably stable through time. I mean, I would argue stable over millennia, but for the sake of this, I'll say at least the last 200 years, because that seems an easier, you know, bracket. Basically, since mechanization and industrialization, we could say there are a set of things that shape us. And none of them are surprising, but all of them have profound implications for technology development and technology adoption over time. First one, guess what? Not a surprise. What's the thing about human beings? We are social creatures. How do we think about ourselves? As part of networks of social relatedness. Friends and family, more important than almost anything else, kith and kin. <laughs> There's a reason that language is deeply embedded in our psyche. We are social creatures. We are defined in relationship to others, whether it is, oh my God, please don't let me be anything like my mother, or I know he's my brother, but I don't, just over there, that'd be good. Now, we know that what it means to talk about family has changed. It's undergone a profound shift in the United States just in the last two to three years. Think about legislation around gay marriage. Think about changing notions about adoption. Think about changing ideas about what it means to be a family. But what's being argued for, what's being litigated, what's being sought after is the right to define oneself as family. Because it turns out that's a powerful social lens and a powerful social tool. It also turns out that technologies that facilitate familiness and friendships are technologies that have been profoundly successful. We can see it just in the last five to 10 years of technologies. You know, after all, what is Facebook about if not about a form of extended sociality? Uh, the birth of children is the biggest trigger of buying video cameras to this day. The birth of grandchildren is one of the biggest triggers of driving uh, grandparent level onto social media. Uh, we know there's a whole series of technologies that when they facilitate social networks, it's a big thing, right? And if you have a technology that does this effectively, you, it is a technology that is ultimately successful. Technologies that break this tend not to work. This also means that sometimes we imagine users are single individual objects. They tend not to be. Think about most of the UI that are being built out currently, uh, particularly voice-based. There are some really interesting challenges if those UIs need to be shared with more than one person. Uh, I have an Alexa at home. I love my Alexa. I actually tell Alexa I love her, which is an embarrassing thing, but I turn out not to be alone. There's about a million people who do that around the you know, planet on a regular basis. Kind of scary, but still. Um, Alexa and I do just fine because I live alone. Alexa knows she should listen to me and me only. When someone else comes over, Alexa doesn't know she shouldn't listen to them and she routinely does what they ask to, which is not helpful. Teaching Alexa who it is she should listen to is actually not a trivial problem. 
Teaching a voice-activated system who is in charge in any given moment of time would be to solve a human problem that no one has solved up until now. I'm willing to bet for any one of you in the room who shares your life with another human being, you have no idea who is in charge most of the time. You're probably just acutely aware it isn't you, but you don't know why. Imagining a system that solves that problem is actually to imagine solving a technical problem that is not a technical problem, it is in fact a social problem. It is about social power and the complicated calculation of who gets to make certain decisions. So as we imagine building out technological infrastructures, thinking about how those infrastructures respond to human beings has been easy when it's a one-to-one -one relationship. It gets much more complicated when it is a one-to-many. And using our imaginations to solve that is actually going to be a big challenge. Think again about autonomous vehicles, where we started back in 1956. It might be easy to say an autonomous vehicle's voice control system should only respond to the driver. That might be nice, except we know that passengers are actually a critical part of that experience and sometimes a useful safety check. So how do you start to imagine that? So thinking here about the fact that humans as users are rarely individual users, but actually part of a complex calculation of multiple users is in fact a critical part of how we think about building out a world in which we can actively and accurately function. It's also the case that beyond our friends and family, we have a strong need as human beings to belong to a community that shares our values and shares our practices. And this dates back a long time. Think of this as being about the guilds of the 15th and 16th centuries, the trade unions of the last 100 years, maybe in the United States, everything from the Lions Club to Rotary, but also your church, a youth group, a sporting team. <laughs> There's lots of things we want to believe, sort of belong to, right? Places that share our practices and our values. And truthfully, the internet has also in some ways really mapped into this. Think about the early days of MUDs and Moos. Think about more recently things like Pinterest, which simply map right on top of this. Think about the interceding moment of eBay, whose origin story is about people who all cared about um, Pez dispensers, who wanted to find a way to trade them online. <laughs> we know, truly, it's a wonderful origin story. Um, we know that the notion of people who share your preoccupations drives a whole set of practices online and has been a really interesting way of thinking about what happens here, right? This is also about why certain kinds of communities and practices have wanted to establish everything from their own web pages to their own avatars to their own devices. There is something here about the notion of a form of identity that is beyond family to a slightly larger, more diffuse in some ways network. The third one in this place is something even a little more meta beyond that, which is that I think human beings desperately want meaning beyond their families and their communities of practice. We want to believe there's something bigger than ourselves. We want to believe that there is something that makes it matter and something that gives it all meaning. Over the last couple of hundred years, that's been everything from religion and the idea of a god to the idea of nations. I mean, frankly, the United States is founded on one such idea, an idea that was bigger than every individual, but an idea that made us all citizens of one place and a citizenship based on a shared set of values and a shared set of ideals. We also know this is true about various social movements. Think about the suffragettes. A hundred years ago, there were a set of women who shared a collective belief in a single outcome. Civil rights movement, the same. The gay rights movement, the same. Frankly, I think you can look in the contemporary period and see multiple ideas that are shared not everyone shares them, but they are profoundly motivating. Quickest way to think about this in the current moment, I think, would usually be around the use of hashtags. <laughs> I think Black Lives Matter is an obvious example here, but there are others, a series of them that are local to various countries. Australia has a set around Aboriginal issues, certainly a set in multiple other places around the world. But also think about the way that both nation states and other groups have mobilised internet connectivity as a way of driving change. So, you know, whether we think about the Arab Spring as successful or not, the constellation of mobile phones and the internet and other kinds of technologies were part and parcel of how a different identity got established and sort of moved around the globe and people could identify with it. But this notion that there is a larger thing, something beyond what we are doing in our daily lives, 
is in fact part and parcel of what makes us human and it has been remarkably stable over time. The need for it, not the content of the box, but the need for it has been. And frankly, you see governments working in these spaces, not usually in the United States, but elsewhere, whether it's Singapore's, you know, decadental kind of notion of itself as we're back to the sort of the smart island language again. There was the connected island 10 years ago. Here, the notion is that technology is connected to citizenship, is connected to progress and notions of kind of re-engagement of citizenship. Korea is the same, South Korea. I mean, there's a long kind of standing notion we're in the middle of a five-year cycle there around the ubiquitous society or the you society where technology, production and consumption is linked to ideas of good citizenship. But here the idea is that technology isn't just about its perfunctory work, its actual function. It's also about what is the meaning that gets layered on it and the meaning that it is used to produce. And think about also here how data sets are going to be used and about how data might be used to generate forms of participation. Uh, think about how any number of websites trafficking in DNA profiles will create certain kinds of identities and identifications. Think about how data about our various activities will drive participation and notions of meaning. And you start to sort of say, oh, there are some interesting questions in all of that. But if you imagine these as layers, right, there is us as sort of friends and family communities of practice and this bigger thing that turns out to be a fourth thing about what makes us human that is remarkably stable over time, which is that we need some way of conveying all of that membership in various groups to others. But frankly, in fact, the first people we are conveying that membership to is ourselves. And as human beings over, I would argue again, as an anthropologist millennia, we have used objects and stuff to talk about who we were, first to ourselves and then to others. Some of it's as simple as and, you know, as sort of time standing as the stuff we put on our bodies. Clothing, jewellery, ritual objects. It's about the colours we choose. It's about the football jerseys we wear. It's about wedding rings or not. It's about piercings or not. It's about tattoos and what those might mean. It's also about what devices you carry. So the politics of this have changed over the last decade, but certainly five years ago, there were a set of assessments we put on people who carried Apple paraphernalia versus everyone else. We still continue to make judgments about people based on their operating systems. <laughs> are you an Android person? Are you a Mac OS? Are you, God forbid, a Linux person? And what would we say about that? And there are multiple assessments we base on that, right, versus likewise on what are your social networking platforms of choice? Are you Facebook? Are you Instagram? Are you Snapchat? What does that mean about you? What is the avatar you are using? We know how to read those landscapes, both as participants and as audience. And frankly, technology has played a large part of that over a protracted period of time about what is the stuff we use and how might we use it. And thinking carefully about how those things matter is hugely important here. And it's really important to remember it's not just a performance for other, it is first a in some ways, a dialogue with self. So the things we put on our bodies are first about how we both reassure ourselves and acknowledge to ourselves who we are and then play it out for a, a larger body of audience. Some things no one else will ever know about what we are up to. What lingerie we have on, for instance, may well be a dialogue we are having with ourselves that is not intended to be shared. But, you know, we know we are engaging in it for a bit may not be useful for the men in the room, but nonetheless, we know we're engaging in a particular dialogue with self here about how we feel. And how you think about the role of technology in this is kind of critical. Last but by no means least, if you allow that we are using things to talk about who we are and that we care about who we are, you also have to imagine that there is this fifth thing that as human beings we are inevitably intertwined with, which is that as human beings we uh, tell lies and keep secrets. If you imagine we are constantly engaging in social activity, we are engaging in community and meaning and stuff, you also have to imagine that we worry tremendously and we care about how we are made sense of. Uh, human beings are liars. I don't mean that as a moral judgment. I merely mean it as a statement inexplicably and ironically of truth. Uh, if you listen to the average psychologist, they will tell you that human beings, yeah, depending on where you are on the spectrum, tell somewhere between six to 200 lies a day. By the time you get out to 200, you are running for president in the United States. But you can get to six pretty quickly. Did you sleep well? Did you like that food? Was the speaker any good? No, you don't look fat in that. Yes, that was an excellent invitation. I'm very much looking forward to the next one. And you're done. You're already at average. You can kind of excel past that, and it's not that tricky. Are we doing that because we're net bad people? No. 
Are we engaged in that because we don't want to upset others? Absolutely. Is it about sometimes presenting a better self? Yes. Have we been doing that before the internet came along? Absolutely. There is a reason why every major, you know, uh, axial religion, a religion with a book, has a prescription about lying and where there are classifications of it, the permissible lie, you know, sins of omission and commission, you know, lies that are kind of okay, lies to keep nations together. You know, there are even kind of the, you know, uh, in Hindi there is a lovely expression that, you know, a thousand lies are permissible so long as the wedding takes place, which tells you that, you know. <laughs> and, you know, there are many other variants on that in all of our cultures. So lying is inherently human. It is not inherently bad, but technology fits into this in some unexpected ways. So some of the early kind of cyber psychologist people who worked on how we felt about and how we behaved online found that one of the interesting things about lies told online was that we didn't feel the same emotional compunction about it. So offline lying for the most of us, aside from the really small ones like, yes, that food was good, <laughs> the bigger lies, we usually have a set of emotional re reactions to that, right? Guilt, shame, anxiety, a few other things. You know, We feel bad about it because we're trained to imagine it's not good, even if we're all doing it. Um, the reality is thus far, lying online is not accompanied by any of those feelings. It is sometimes, in fact, accompanied by feelings of pleasure and glee and delight. Yeah, exactly. That goes a long way to explaining a couple of things. One, I think it goes a long way to explaining trolling, that this is, in fact, part and parcel of a set of social behaviors where the social regulatory function has not followed onto the internet thus far. The second thing is I think it creates really interesting challenges for those of us who use the internet as a place to sample data. So if you are doing online questionnaires, if you are doing online surveying, if you are doing anything to engage in collection of information via a digital mediated format, you have this interesting problem that you might not have had if you were doing it offline which is that there is a veracity problem. Um, I have a colleague of mine uh, who was at Cornell for a long time who studies what he calls digital deception. And he decided that he wanted to kind of track that and went looking at a place where he figured it would be reliably present. So he went and looked at online dating. Um, discovered that in the United States, 100% of people, that's all of them, lied about their online dating profiles, about something. Men and women lied differently. No surprise there. Men added three to five inches to their height. Women shaved five pounds off their weight. I'd like to suggest there was a critical difference there, but that's just me. Um, but he discovered that everyone did it. And so what he basically said was, well, if you know everyone is doing it, you can apply a kind of logic to it. So if you've got 100% lies, it's basically like having 100% truth. You just know that there's some in interesting issues about how you might think about it. It is more of a problem if you imagine you have 80% lies or 50% lies and you don't know what the lying is about. My colleague, Professor Hancock, says that in fact there are some algorithms you can build to start to detect lies, and this is true as much in lies offline as online, is that the lie tends to be elaborated. There's a lot more detail to it that is much more consistent over time and a lot more words. So you could start to test, you know, are the utterances you are tracking online lies or not, but that gets you into another interesting set of challenges. However, if we imagine this is a constant human behavior not resolved by technology or in some ways exacerbated by it, we find ourselves in an interesting place. Particularly if you layer onto this the unexpected challenge that most of our technology objects only know how to blurt out the truth unbidden and sometimes unwanted. So think about you turn up somewhere. I did this recently. I went to LA for an Intel event. I tweeted that I was there. I forgot to turn off the geographic locator. Um, and I sort of also vaguely forgot I was in LA and that I wasn't seeing people who know me there. And so what I got was a barrage of, oi, what are you doing in town and not telling me? And I'm like, oh, crap. Because you can't very well say, well, I really wasn't here very long because my foot, digital footprint suggested exactly how long I was there. So there was this piece here about how would one have managed that historically, right? Well, you would have said, well, my circles aren't overlapping. I'm here overnight. A bunch of people, well, you know, I just won't see them. But now I have a device that wants to proclaim precisely where I am and precisely what I am up to. And unless I remember to tell it not to, it does it anyway. So now we have this interesting tension, right, between devices that want to tell, quote unquote, the whole truth and human beings who are much more circumspect about their location and other things. And how you manage that tension isn't just a matter of saying, well, you need to opt in or opt out to locatedness, right? Because sometimes that's a more complicated calculation. So we have that challenge, right? We also have the challenge of secrecy. So one of the ways human beings establish relationships is by reciprocal disclosures. I tell you something intimate about myself, chances are you'll tell me something in return and we become the keepers of each other's secrets. 
that notion of secrecy is deeply embedded in our culture and runs counter to the kind of similarly cultural discourse around transparency. Well, we argue that transparency is going to be the solution to all these problems, and yet there are reasons why things are kept secret. So how we balance that out is actually quite complicated. And truthfully, you know, I would argue in an era of both Assange and Snowden, the only way to keep secrets is to have them be non-digital, but even that is not necessarily a mechanism here. But imagine how it is that we will start to keep secrets. My suspicion is that some of them will be kept in plain sight, and it will be that things have multiple meanings. But these aren't human features that go away, right? These are things about who we have always been and arguably who we always will be. So as we design systems, we need to be thinking about the fact that those things are always true. Five things that don't change. Friends and family, communities of practice, a need for a bigger meaning, stuff talks about who we are, and we tell secrets and lies. Five unchanging things. There are also five things about which we have been anxious i want to argue also in perpetuity but we'll say just at least for the last 200 years and in some ways they map back to those same things that haven't changed not really surprising right first thing is we want to share stuff but we also worry about what people will think about us as a result of that um you know we have called this the privacy debate i think that's a bit of a red herring it's not really about privacy per se it's about what are the assessments made on the basis of disclosures of data which is a slightly different way of thinking about it, right? Privacy is often understood as what people don't know. I think the human anxiety here is what people will make sense of when they do know things. I mean, to loosely paraphrase, you know, Philip Seymour Hoffman, here we are all pretty much desperately uncool and really hoping people won't know that about us. <laughs> and so one of our anxieties here is about what happens when information gets out and what are the judgments made on the basis of it. This becomes infinitely more complicated in a world where there are multiple data sources and those data sources circulate in ways we don't necessarily understand. And sometimes they're disclosures we made and didn't think what would happen next. In the most benign sense, I went to my ATM not that long ago and it wished me a happy birthday. Now, on the one hand, of course, my bank knows my birthday. They also have my mortgage. On the other hand, what else do they know about me that I've forgotten? I told them that they plan to tell me later in some way that will make me go, that's really creepy. And in fact, they did, because they then wished me a happy anniversary. <laughs> and I went, still single, whose anniversary? Oh, my anniversary with the bank. I'm like, <laughs> okay, not something I thought I should celebrate with flowers and champagne, which was what was on the screen. And I'm like, wow, okay. And that seemed mild, right? I'm a little worrying that my longest relationship in life is apparently with the bank, but still, you're like, okay. But now imagine scaling that up. Right? What will be the consequences, particularly in a world of data, where suddenly judgments are rendered against us that we didn't realize could be made? So, you know, there's at least one American HMO has a fairly large base of users who bought the credit card data of all their users. So now they have your healthcare data and your credit card data. And their first pass was just to say, well, we're just going to look at it at a meta level. We're just going to, you know, anonymize it out, look at what these two data sets tell us. Yeah, first pass of data didn't tell them anything that, you know, told them things that as a, as a human being, you're like, I knew that was true. Uh, first one being that IKEA purchases are tightly correlated to emergency room admissions. So if you ever, <laughs> so if you ever thought you could do yourself damage with an Allen key, you are not wrong and you would not be alone in this. And, you know, also turned out possibly less funnily that, you know, there was a correlation between fast food restaurant purchases and poor health outcomes. And again, you know, we do kind of know that. It's not so we needed data to do that. But at the point you can combine data sets like that, there are other questions about what next happens. And, you know, if you are now negotiating with your doctor and your doctor has much more information about you than she used to have and she is now telling you things about how you should behave, on the one hand, you should know that she knows that and it's really kind of inevitable. On the other hand, what are the assessments that will be made there and how will we feel about it? And it's actually quite a complicated space, right, as we start to think about, is that about privacy? Well, yeah, at one level. But is it actually about reputation? Absolutely. And then about how you will be assessed and judged. And humans have always worried about this. This is hardly a new thing, right? You know, the phrase keeping up with the Joneses was always not about privacy. It was about reputation. We fully understand, you know, those of us who, you know, either grew up working class like I did or really anywhere that, you know, what you wore the first day back to school and what year you carried, those weren't privacy things. They were reputation things and they were scary because they said things about us. Now you can magnify that out in ways I think that are totally unexpected. 
and no one solved this problem, right? Every time we think we're solving a data privacy problem, there's this other human problem that is not being resolved. And the judgment possibility here is very different than it has been. I think the second space is, is this really interesting thing about human beings, which is we really like um, bored, is one way of saying it. We like the familiar. We like things that we've had all the time, right? Hence the phrase comfort food. <laughs> like, you know, hence we have kind of human rituals that we do under moments of anxiety or pleasure, right? There are things that we just do because we like things that are familiar. That's actually a comforting thing for us. Um, but it turns out that we also like moments of wonder and surprise. And we always have, right? And there's always been this tension between doing the same thing over and over again and occasionally wanting to do something completely different. And that's fine. And that's been a persistent human tension, right, of the, you know, adventurers versus the stay-at-home people. But even the stay-at-home people occasionally want to do something different. That's been around forever. We live in an interesting moment where the tension on this is more than it's ever been. Think about recommendation engines as just an example of this in a world of algorithms and data. What do recommendation engines do? Well, they make recommendations. What are they using to do that? Everything that happened before. What is the challenge with that? They are always retrospective. What is the thing about taste and a desire to be surprised? Some of it has to be prospective and different than the retrospective. But if everything that recommends content and experiences to you is only looking at what has been, it starts to make decisions about who you are that doesn't let you change. And if all algorithms know how to do is what you have done and don't yet know how to know that you are approaching the moment of bored, so familiar, 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 bored, want something new, all the algorithms know is familiar, 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 familiar. Take Netflix as an example. I'm willing to bet most of us use some variant of that. It dishes up content to you on the basis of stuff you've watched before. They're like, hey, you like that? You'll like these two. And that's usually based on shared theme, topic, director, actor, genre. Now, the thing is, as human beings, you can get into a groove. And most of America did for about a decade. It was a lot of reality TV shows. Pretty much housewives of everywhere. Housewives of New Jersey, Orange County, Houston, Dallas, Atlanta, Melbourne, inexplicably why Australian housewives are in there, I do not know. Many housewives, right? And if you had been a television producer, you could have reasonably have said, more housewives, good. Maybe more reality TV shows, excellent. If you were the very smart people at HBO, you said, Hmm. Well, yeah, a lot of reality TV shows, but you know, there's a couple of shows that have kind of been breakout hits and they seem to be narrative based and more speculative. Breaking Bad would have been the obvious one that they were tracking and Mad Men were the two they were looking at at the time. And they said, hmm, you know, we've had this project knocking around for a bit, maybe we should green light it. And that was Game of Thrones. And they knew that there would be an audience for it because in fact, what they were sensing in the ecosystem was boredom. That people had had enough of the same thing and were waiting for something new. But they did that through human intelligence, not through an algorithm. So what would it mean to think about an algorithm of recommendation that is simultaneously detecting the point at which people are willing to imagine something different? At the moment, it's, it doesn't exist because they're all of familiarity and same. But the thing that makes us human in some ways is also that we like to reinvent ourselves. So what would it be to imagine that in a world of data analytics? A moment where you say, hey, you, you always do this, but you know, maybe you'd like something else. Or in my instance, yeah, you're in a new city and I know you want coffee because you always want coffee and here is some good coffee. But you should go look at this piece of public art first because it's trans, you know, it will, it's transcending. And that would actually be a nice thing, but it breaks the logic of how we have thought about using data because we imagine it is about efficiency and replication of prior experiences rather than deviation and newness. One of the other challenges we have that is both device and data centric is this notion about humans as always on and always connected. So we've experienced the last decade as always on and always connected, but the reality is that as human beings, we function better when we're intermittently disconnected. Hence the need for sleep, hence every major world system that has some time that is different than others. Weekends, the Sabbath, golden week. Ramadan, Lent, whatever it is, right? We have ideas built into our calendars, the weekend, <laughs> where time is experienced differently and where there are contours to that time that are not flattened out. Technology has had this interesting consequence of flattening out time, where there is no longer necessarily a delta between day and night, week and weekend, fasting and not fasting. And so one of the interesting challenges here is about this tension, right, between the desire to feel time and the desire to want constant access. The internet is not the first technology that's disrupted this. Frankly, electricity and indoor lighting made some profound changes to our notions about time. 
as have other things, but this one is in some ways the most critical challenge to it. What's interesting as we look around the broader ecosystem is that while we have had a decade where effectively the devices, I, I don't like this language, but the devices won. <laughs> you know, the device was like, I need electricity now. I need to be plugged in. I want to be connected. And I want you to look after me while that is all happening. And we went, okay. And we liked the idea we could shop at two o'clock in the morning or we could download books to read at three. That was great. Nothing to complain about any of that. But we also know from both studies about humans and efficiency and sleep patterns that there is something about wanting to carve out a bit of time that is device and screen free. What we're starting to see is two very different kind of, I would say, sort of whispers in the ecosystem about where that is going. One comes out of Europe where a couple of big uh, European companies that we know about have done things like, wait for it, wait for it, turned off the email servers at five o'clock on a Friday afternoon and not turned them back on again until 8 a.m. on a Monday morning. I know, dude, why don't you think about that for a second? And apparently if you send an email inside the system to someone else over the weekend, you get a little stern note that says, hey, no email. <laughs> Studies show 48 hours off continuously, better for you, please stop emailing. And if you send another one, supervisors get involved, it is not good. If you send an email to the company from outside the company, you get a little happy note that says, we'll be get back to you first thing Monday morning. And I'm not talking about small companies, I'm talking about big companies. Now, you know, they're granted they're companies who are mostly European facing, so they have time zones to their advantage. But there is something really interesting about starting to say, listen, we've had a culture of constant contact, and that actually had some negative consequences. We've now studied it and benchmarked it, and we are actually going to configure our network differently. Because just because the network can be 24 hours a day, seven days a week, doesn't mean it has to be. And there was something really interesting about starting to say, what would it mean to configure a network around human beings rather than f configuring human beings around the network? Similarly, you've seen in the United States a very different pattern of, I would argue, kind of resistance to this, which has been the language around things like digital detox, analog August, um, a bunch of other things this way. Last summer, and again this summer, there was a summer camp for grown-ups run in Silicon Valley where you paid a not inconsiderable amount of money to go somewhere where they confiscated your phone and wouldn't let you online and gave you power tools and alcohol, near as I could figure. I'm like, wow. <laughs> I had a brief moment where I thought I could sell out the entire of my country as a vacation spot for just this kind of activity, but maybe not. But there was something interesting about people willingly wanting to engage in an experience where someone else confiscated their technology so they didn't have to feel like they were the one disconnecting, someone else was doing it for them. But that suggests to me that there is continuing here a kind of ambivalence, right, about this notion of access and time that hasn't yet been resolved. And this is a place where actually data can perform an interesting function. You know, can you use data sets to determine how much traffic there is on weekends and decide you just didn't need to encourage it? Can you decide these are when people are sleeping and shut down devices this way? Are there other ways of thinking about making a world that feels a little more human in this regard? But this tension doesn't go away. Last but almost least in this list of things that don't change for human beings is that we also have a really interesting, and I would say this is a... Well, this is since Byron died. So this is like a 1820 to now kind of phenomena, right? Where we have this really interesting relationship to what we sometimes call celebrity or what you might think of as publicity versus privacy. So, you know, how much do you want to be on display versus how much do you want not to be? And there is certainly in the last, I'd say, decade or so, a kind of a cult of a fascination with people who are in the spotlight. Um, I would argue for most of us at an individual level, it's not quite like that, but we do want a kind of capacity to be known. We like to post things. We like it when people like the things we post. There's a kind of nice reinforcement cycle that goes there. By the same token, most of us as human beings do not want our entire lives in a digital library that can be instantly accessed. Um, you know, I've certainly been in enough user conferences where people talk about the kind of in-ear or over-eye device that will connect to a data set that will always tell you who you were talking to. We can go, oh, we've met before. Nice to see you again. Oh, shit, I should have answered that email. You know, that would be lovely when you went to conferences and meet the inevitable run of people who know you and you have no idea who they are. Or you don't remember if you met them or you think you might have and you don't remember how that last interaction went. That might be nice. The flip side of that is that the technology that makes that possible is also the technology that would make possible everything being stored in perpetuity. And one of the things that turns out about human beings is that, in fact, our ability to forget isn't just a sign of old age and diminished cognition. It's actually a form of psychological protection. It turns out if you had to remember everything you'd ever said and everything that had ever been said to you in the whole arc of your lifetime, this would not feel good. 
the need to be able to forget some of the awful things you said, some of the awful things that were said to you is the only reason, in fact, we are psychologically functioning. Think of it as the need to be forgiven and forgotten, basically, and that there's some really interesting tension here in the stories we tell about both data sets, the diminishing price of storage, the ability to remember everything, and the notion of human beings that actually there are some things we need to forget. You know, some of it's, you know, Freudian denial. Some of it's just some things are best left not in read-write access, <laughs> but deleted. And you can see this playing out at law, right? You have the EU talking about the right to be forgotten, so instantiating into the digital world a right for some things not to be digital. You have other places like my home country of Australia going to a notion of full data retention. All data will be retained. They haven't actually quite worked out how to do it technically, but that is the law currently that this will happen. How that data will be accessed, how it will be used, raises other troubling questions about data hygiene, data retention, data access. But frankly, in here is also a human preoccupation, right, about what it means to be remembered and to be forgotten. And it was easier when it was just a device world. You lost the device, a whole lot of things got lost with it. Most of your text messages went away. Maybe you lost some photos. Now it's all in the cloud. That's a different issue, right, is that you don't have those kind of unexpected moments of spontaneous regeneration. What you have is constant data following you everywhere. And I think resolving this one also is very tricky. Last but by no means least, this has been true, again, since the earliest waves of industrialization and mechanization. In many societies, particularly Western ones, we have a real ambivalence to technology. On the one hand, we love, love, love it. On the other hand, we don't like it at all. And these tend to go in sequence. I mean, think of this as the Gartner hype curve. Yay, boo, <laughs> that's kind of it, right? Yay, new technology, very exciting. We'll solve everything, change everything, we'll be great. Ah, new technology, bad, nothing good is gonna come of it, very, very bad, and then, oh, that was it? And that's kind of it, right? And that goes over any period of time from like a week to a decade to 100 years. And some of those it, anxieties never go away. You know, we are still anxious about television some 60, 70 years after its introduction, depending on your country. You know, we worry about is too much television bad for us? How much television should you let kids have? You know, does it shape our consciousness? Is it bad that we're watching it from other countries? You know, we still have those things. They're not quite as pronounced as they were 40 years ago when, it, you know, there were notions about, you know, was television killing our culture and bad for our brains? But the anxiety about it hasn't really gone away, even though technology itself is a profoundly different beast than it was in the 1950s. We also know that there are some of the same anxieties about electricity. They're a little diminished than they were 100 years ago, but we still sort of worry about how much we use, what does it mean to use it, how much do things need to be electrified, is it bad for our bodies? I mean, we still worry about those things. The internet is just the next one in a long line of those things that fell into that language. As it turns out, I mean, I would argue today's sort of yay, boo, uh, is kind of around artificial intelligence, you know, which is in some ways has replaced the conversation of robots of 15 months to 18 months ago. And now the conversation about artificial intelligence is, you know, it will change everything for the better. It will take our jobs. That's it. You know, sort of that kind of conversation, right? And those things are inherently, frankly, part of the dialogue about technology for at least 200 years. And usually there are a particular set of places those anxieties play out on the bodies of children, so children are often part and parcel of our anxiety profile, uh, frequently women, it turns out, um, and then a little bit around kind of uh, crime and criminality tend to be the places, right? And then the stories around what technology will do are inevitably the same and are less about the technological affordances and more about the fact that those technologies are part of longstanding cultural constellations. So our fear of AI, the fear of robots, those are actually fears that come from Mary Shelley and Frankenstein, which in turn come from Gollum, which in turn have long-standing historical antecedents. So, you know, the anxieties are much deeper than the technologies themselves are, but they tap into those things. So there is this piece here, right, where we're constantly seduced by the promise of new technology, but are deeply anxiety and ambivalent ridden about what it will happen when it arrives. So where does that leave us, right? Well, for me, I think one of the critical things here is that as you are building next generation technologies, services, applications, frankly, thinking about data sets, is there are some questions you should be asking yourself. One of them is, does this do something good or play to friends and family, community, bigger meaning, stuff, and secrets and lies? Because if you can tap into one of those threads, you're almost inevitably successful. And that's a way to kind of, I think, move and propel a business forward. I think if you can find a way to tackle one of these other challenges around 
time, reputation, forgetfulness, one of those, you can solve one of those problems, that's revolutionary because those problems are long standing. If you can't solve them, you certainly need to be thinking about them. Do I think we can introduce a new technology without an accompanying ambivalence? No. Do I think there are ways of mediating that ambivalence? Absolutely. And part of it is, you know, honouring the fact that it exists and it, while, while it may appear irrational to technologists, it's actually deeply rooted in our cultural DNA and psyche. So part of it becomes as you think about building the next generation of technology, I actually think we need to think about ourselves as part and parcel of the equation. The things we care about, the things we worry about, and as we build out the next generation of infrastructures and devices and services and all the things that make that work, imagining ourselves as part and parcel of that infrastructure is for me the most important thing. So it is about this notion of what it will mean to be human in these worlds because we're building them and ultimately we ought to also inhabit them a little more comfortably than we currently do. So with that, I'm gonna stop and say thank you. And we have time for all, given the rate at which I talk, one or two questions. <laughs> thank you very much for coming You're very and welcome. Today. Um, so we do have a couple of questions, uh, the first of which is, how do you characterize and take into account the range of differences when thinking about all these behaviors across cultures and individuals? That is, you're talking about our similarities, but what about our differences? Mm. Good question. As an anthropologist, I usually hate speaking in cultural generalities. These are all of those. Um, I am acutely aware that the interesting thing about many of these characteristics, so friends and family, community, meta-meaning, those things matter across cultures, but they look different in different places. So how you look to larger bodies for meaning, it looks profoundly different in different cultures. Uh, the US on the friends and family thing, the US is one of the few cultures in the world that indexes as aggressively to individual identity. So, you know, we are first and foremost the smallest meaning, smallest unit of social meaning in the United States is the individual. That's actually quite rare across the world, but Americans still think of themselves as part of friends and family. It just looks different in different places. So I've thought long and hard about how much this works in multiple cultural domains. It does. Were you talking about it in other places? You might give very different examples about what friends and family looks like, about what communities look like and about who participates in them. And frankly, some of the conversations about how privacy is played out and reputation look very different and there are different ways of thinking about it. My colleagues from Russia always used to joke with me that uh, pre perestroika in Russia, the notion of keeping up with the Joneses was entirely the wrong metaphor. You wanted to keep away from the Joneses because they would be the first people the KGB came for. And so <laughs> there was sort of something, something delightful here, right, about notions of sort of reputation there. And similarly, when we were doing fieldwork in France a couple of years ago, we were looking at uh, recommendation algorithms and the front ones for French television did this really interesting thing where they would tell you the most watched shows and the least watched shows. And most of the households we were in went to the least watched shows as the ones to watch, not the ones that everyone was watching. We went, why are you doing that? And they went, well, it might be shit, but I'll be the first person who saw it. And so their reputation was being configured completely differently, right? It wasn't that you wanted to do what everyone else was doing. You wanted to be the first person doing something else. So while these things look different in different places, I have some reasonable confidence that they are not a bad index for thinking on a kind of global scale. Thank you. You're welcome. Next question. Yes, sir. As a woman leader in a highly technical company and as an anthropologist, using your expertise and training in a revolutionary way, here's Go the question. Me. Here at Mozilla, we want to be more inclusive of all kinds of expertise and backgrounds. We've found that we struggle to bring engineering expertise and other kinds of expertise together in an impactful way. Do you have any advice for us? Oh, I have so much advice and scars. Um, so listen, I think one of the most interesting things that we need moving forward in anywhere across the sort of tech industry and ecosystem is we need more diversity of thought. I mean, frankly, I think we need more diversity of bodies and embodiment. That'd be a good first step. So like more women, that would be excellent. I think you also have to think about more diversity of backgrounds and disciplines and thought. I think, you know, we need more social scientists, more people from the humanities. I frankly think we could do with a bit more art and poetry in our lives and also in our thinking. The challenge to bringing all of those disciplines together across the humanities, the social sciences, the arts and the sciences is that we all come from different preoccupations. We have different canonical thinking and different methodologies. 
And in the interdisciplinary institutes I participated in in the academy before I came to industry, what ended up happening was that people would write papers and they just bolt on the sociology section and the history section and the economy section and they would read as though they were different thoughts. That's not what it means for me to think about how you drive interdisciplinary thinking. The challenge, however, is to break through that is hard work and it takes time and an upfront investment. So when I built my first interdisciplinary labs at Intel and I was spanning from computer science through engineering and technology research into human factors, engineering, industrial design, interaction design, sociology, anthropology, cognitive psychology, and dance, because one should. So that was a lot of different kind of skills, right? And the first year was brutal. And there was a lot of people being really pissed off and frequently in my cube complaining about the fact that they had to work with so-and-so who was obviously an idiot. And Everyone thought everyone else was an idiot. There was a lot of that. And that this could never work and it was just a bad idea and when was I going to stop it? And I'd just be like, when are you going to give me the next thing that you, I'm owed? Like, go away. I, I just go sort it out. And every now and again when it got really bad, I would make everyone come to my house and I would feed them because I'm firmly convinced in a very old-fashioned way that breaking bread together matters, that there is something about actually trusting people as human beings and knowing them as human beings, not just knowing them as their skill sets that matter. And I know most team building exercises are hokey and unpleasant and we hate participating in them. I think there has to be another way of driving what those things are really about, which is that when you know someone as a person, not just as their skill set and their tagline, it makes it a little bit easier to start imagining having a work encounter with them too. But what I know is that you want to drive into disciplinarity, you have to be prepared to make an upfront investment. And I, in my experience, that upfront investment is at least a year of less productivity than you'd like. Once you get through that, however, you know, the teams that I built 10 years ago have long since broken apart, but the people who were in those teams have now gone off and built their own interdisciplinary teams because they knew that was the best way to get to an answer. What we also know is that those teams tend to be a little bit more con conflict driven, not bad conflict, but there tends to be a lot more debate and discussions take a little bit longer at the upfront because in fact what people are doing is bringing different points of view to bear. Now the challenge is that's a big investment. The kind of upside is once it's done, it is, in fact, I found self-reproducing and it takes itself sort of in a viral way out from beyond those groups into other places. But you have to be willing to put the time in and have a leadership who are willing to kind of work through the inevitable first year of, he's an idiot. She's an idiot. They're all idiots. I don't want to work with them anymore. I hate this team. Why are you making me do this? You have to work through that. And that takes a little bit of, I think, leadership strength to decide you want to come to the other side of that. Because frankly, it's just much easier to have teams that work together and know each other and are, you know, like, likes, like. But I don't think that gets you to such a good outcome. Short answer is you've got to invest time and it will be painful. Longer answer is once you've done it, it will be much better. So long as better also includes a bit more yelling. <laughs> or at least fierce debate. Thank you. One final quick question. Could... Do you have a recommended reading list for some of the subjects you talk about? For example, recent anthropo anthropological works, especially with regard to our online lives. Yes, everything on my shelves. Anyone who follows me on Twitter knows how big my shelves are. Um, I still think there's a couple of really good books, so plug my own stuff. Uh, I just put out a reader with Larissa Horath um, and Heather Horst and Anne Galloway, I think it's probably out of Rutledge, has some title like Digital Ethnography. I should know. I can see the cover. I can't tell you the title. I still think Tom Bolstroff's Coming of Age in Second Life, which was an ethnography of Second Life, as it sounds, kind of a la Margaret Mead, is actually a great read for thinking about how you might encounter the digital world. There are a couple of people who I think work is fabulous. Uh, Kate Crawford at Microsoft Labs, who does stuff on big data is amazing. She's a sociologist, kind of got a set of encounters there. Uh, Mel Gregg, who's with me at Intel, has a prior book on work and intimacy and an upcoming one on time, all of which are kind of critical ways of thinking about the internet. So no, there's a bunch of really interesting people out there. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And we're done. Yes. Someone asked if you stay longer. No, I have a day job. Must go back to it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yay, bye.